we're really excited to have Mark Lopez uh, with us here. He uh, comes from a family with a long history of activism. Uh, he was raised uh, in the Mothers of East LA, Santa Isabel, uh, an organization co-founded by his grandparents, uh, Juana Beatriz Gutierrez and Ricardo Gutierrez. Uh, and this set his trajectory as a community activist. He engaged in a wide array of student activism when he was a student at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, he earned a bachelor's degree in environmental studies. He also earned his master's degree at Cal State Northridge. Uh, he completed a master's thesis, which don't judge, I've read about half of so far, <laughs> by the way, titled The Fire, Decolonizing Environmental Justice. So it's a good fit for today. Uh, Mark was a member of East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice for three years before he joined the staff. Uh, and after serving as the lead organizer for East Yard Communities and co-director, he then served as the executive director of the organization for over six years. Uh, he's now serving as the East Side Community Organizer and Espresso Special Projects Coordinator. So he organizes on this side of town. Uh, and I like how he puts this. He, he organizes in the area where he was born, raised, and continues to live. Uh, Mark is also the 2017 uh, North American recipient of the Goldman Environmental Prize. So please uh, join me in a round of applause welcoming Mark Lopez. <laughs> So we, we picked you to come and speak with us. Um, we reached out to your organization because you know the, the first two events, we really were at sort of like a high level. We had journalists kind of writing uh, from behind the computer screen. And we had folks running a podcast uh, that really was trying to educate people about it, environment and climate justice. But nobody had been doing the climate work. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where we were really lacking. And so uh, we, you, uh, your organization came highly recommended by those reporters, actually, because I think you guys had collaborated on this. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you don't mind, let me just uh, let me just start. And say but first, acknowledge here too. We have Dr. Alvarez uh, interviewing uh, Mark Lopez with this, and this is uh, Jade Hernandez, who's part of the Public Health Student Association. So I've got a mic on. You have to remind me to pass the little mic around between the three of us. You can hang on to yours. Okay. Uh, so, let's start with this. Um, I think, and, and you can tell me, is East? How do you refer to East Yard? Do you have like a short? Because it's a, it is a mouthful. <laughs> what, what do you call it? Uh, well, first off, just thank you yeah. for for the invitation, um, and especially Jade. I think you know I'm, we're constantly getting hit up for being asked to speak at different campuses and a million other things. Uh, but Jade reaching out to uh, her former teacher, um, who's still an active member of our organization. Uh, that was me. I was like, okay, let me go. Let me go find that email wherever yeah. wherever it's at um, and respond to it. Um, but yeah, I mean, East Yard is East kind Yard? of what we call it for short. Yeah, I mean, E Y C E J is not. It doesn't it, roll off the top. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we usually say East Yard or East Yard community. East Yard. So I'm gonna call it East Yard. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you guys are maybe best known for your work with the Exide battery uh, recycling. Mm -hmm facility problem. I think everybody in this room probably has heard of uh, sort of the lead exposure that's come about in Carson uh, because of that Exide facility. In Vernon, sorry. Uh, Vernon. Yeah, Vernon. Yeah, what yeah. did I say? Carson? Carson. Carson. Yeah. Sorry about that. Vernon. There's a bunch of other stuff happening in Carson. <laughs> okay, well, you can you can break that news to us. Here. Yeah. Um, and I know that East Yard does a lot of work on environmental issues generally. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we could start by you just telling us what East Yard does on a regular yeah. basis and then how you got involved with them and um, even if you want to tell us where the name East Yard came from. For sure, yeah. So East Yard is an actual uh, rail yard. Uh, it's owned by Union Pacific, and they call it the East Los Angeles Intermodal Facility, which is a mouthful. So for short, they call it the East Yard. And we're the communities around it. So we're East Yard communities, right? Um, and the reason the organization started is because of NAFTA. Uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, which y'all might have to Google that, uh, especially the younger folks in here. Uh, but it was a policy that uh, changed trade in North America. And essentially what it did is it decimated the manufacturing that was happening in Commerce and Vernon and uh, Maywood and Val, those areas where there's a lot of industry. Um, all of that became warehousing. And it became essentially parking lots for really large metal containers 
uh, because of all the imports coming into the country. So the rail yard, uh, which actually going way back used to be a Japanese farm until World War II and the internment happened and the land was stolen from the Japanese families who that was their land. Um, and it was sold to the, the rail company. So there's one of the founders of Easter. I was actually a kid when and witnessed all of that happening. Right. So we like to tell that piece of the story, too. Um, but ultimately, what was described as a sleepy rail yard because of NAFTA became uh, one of the largest rail yards in the world uh, across the street from one of the other largest rail yards in the world. Oh, you're kidding. And so now we have a situation where we have something like 40 to 60,000 trucks driving through our communities every day, right? With tons of pollution. We have a lot more trains coming through our communities now, right? Uh, parking behind homes, creating tons of issues. And the primary issues that were coming up, of course, are health issues. Right? We're talking about uh, respiratory issues. We're talking about asthma. We're talking about uh, cancer. And that re didn't really exist in the neighborhoods before. And so folks really started to question, what is happening? Why is this happening? And they pointed to the rail yard. This must be what it is because it's so visible, the pollution, right? And so um, community members started to advocate at the city council because it's the rail yard is in the city of commerce. And the city of commerce was like, you're talking about air pollution. We have nothing to do with air pollution. You got to go to the regional air board. So folks went to the regional air board. And there we met other communities who also are facing similar issues, who are trying to advocate. And the regional air board said, you're talking about uh, mobile sources, right? The sources of pollution move. We don't regulate that. You got to go to the state air board. So we go to the state air board and start meeting other communities around the state. And the state air board says, you're talking about interstate trade. <laughs> <laughs> That's the federal government. And because of that, we built a national network of communities impacted by goods movement, mm -hmm. by ports, by rail yards, by warehouses across the country, right? Seaports and inland ports. Um, and so that's kind of how we built the movement, not necessarily because we had this grand vision, but everybody was pointing the finger and we kept going until it circled back around. Yeah. And, and the federal government said, you got to go back local, right? And so we bring everybody to the table and say, y'all can point at each other. Ain't nobody outside of this room. So the solutions are right here. And we don't even know the solutions because we're not experts, right? All we know is that we're being impacted. We're experts in our experience, mm -hmm. right? As a community. As a community, yeah. And over the years, we do become technical experts because we're sitting in these meetings that, you know, we're, we're going to school by attending these, these public meetings, essentially, right? Um, and luckily now, you know, we have members who go and get their degrees in these fields, right? We're, we're over here, like, learning from our, the doctors of our children, now we got folks who are like in the in the medical field, right? Who are looking at public health, who can bring that knowledge back into into our movement, um, and, and it hasn't stopped uh, because, of course, the federal government also had their own finger to point uh, when we talked about ships, ocean-going vessels, and they said whatever flag they're flying, that's the country that governs them. We don't, so we can't tell them what to do. So we said, okay, let's go visit those countries. Let's go meet with frontline communities in these other countries and assess the, the need, the possibility for building a global movement. So that's currently what we're in the process of doing right now. So last week I was in London, sitting in meetings like 12 hours a day, uh, being like, what the hell is going on? Because I've never been there before, so I'm learning, right? I'm like, who are the players? Who's in here? What are the relationships? All that type of stuff. And when did that work begin? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the organization formed in, um, in 2001. Um, so it's a little over 20 years old. And it formed out of relationships, existing family and community networks, people who went to school together, people who played sports together, people who go to church together, uh, people who are neighbors and family, right? Um, I, I like to say the best community organizers are, are chismosos and chismosas. 
<laughs> right? Like uh, gossipers might be the, uh, not the best translation, but why? Because chismosos and chismosas know everything. They know everybody's business and they talk to everybody. So when something's going down in the neighborhood, they're the best people to let everybody know. Mm -hmm. So they make the best organizers. And so that's kind of how it came together. A lot of it was not knowing, having questions, right? And so we have three kind of guiding questions for our organization, which is what is it? How does it affect us? And what can we do about it? And if we can answer those three questions, we can build a movement. And that's what we've done at the local level, at the regional, at the state, at the national, and now going to, to the global. Um, we don't go in trying to address an issue in our community already knowing. We, we try to figure it out as we go. Nice. And um, just to, I'm going to pass this mic around in just a second, but I just want to acknowledge all the folks that have joined us online. So it looks like we have almost 30 people. Uh, we'd love to see your faces, of course help us build community here, but I appreciate all of you that have done that. I see our master's students uh, and I see some more undergrads participating as well and faculty. Can I just comment how Please. dope that is? Like, like, I don't know, this is just showing the, the kind of uh, like campus community that y'all have built in the department to have undergrads, grad students, students who are organizing the club, faculty, all that, like, and we're working hard. Yeah, this is dope. This is Because usually like, that's not the case. Like, usually it's like, somebody's class is is sitting here because it's the class time right but like the fact that that y'all have this is is really dope we do need it we have our department chair and our faculty and we have an associate dean as well which is really exciting all right jane you've got the next question yeah my question is um, most students of public health have a general understanding of the horrible lead exposures that were created by exide and some of the turmoil ar around that mm -hmm. would you mind recounting some of that story and how east yard and you got involved yeah, so um, just to help understand like the, the process, uh, Exide was a battery recycling company and they recycled car batteries. Um, what they were specifically recycling was the lead. Uh, almost 100% of lead that is in a car battery that you're gonna buy at AutoZone or in a brand new car is recycled, uh, which is great, right? Uh, unfortunately, what they were doing is essentially they would crack the batteries open. They throw them in something called a blast furnace that's just trying to burn everything away and mount the lead so that they can collect the lead and make new batteries, right? But in that process, uh, lead dust was coming out through the uh, exhaust, right, of the, of the factory, um, going into the air and, and blowing whatever direction the wind is blowing in, which unfortunately tended to be north uh, of the factory, which is right here. Um, and that's how the lead got deposited in our community. So it was about 7 million pounds of lead. Um, and I, so I actually grew up uh, door knocking uh, as a kid because my family was, you know, the organization, uh, the Mothers of East LA, Santa Isabel. So as like a 10 year old, I was like knocking on doors to tell people about like lead in paint and lead in Mexican candy and lead in Mexican pottery, right? To try to like reduce the lead levels of other kids in my neighborhood. Um, but that's when the Exide faculty, uh, faculty facility was identified. Um, and so my mom and my grandma actually toured the facility. Um, and so my grandma tells a story of, uh, you know, Exide is trying to put on the show and everything is great. And all these guys, kids, they all go to college. There's no like learning issues or behavioral issues. And so my grandma said, okay, if everything is safe here, why am I like head to toe in hazmat gear? <laughs> right? For the, tour? For the tour? For the tour. And on top of that, why aren't any of your workers wearing this gear? So that was an indicator, right? If the company doesn't even care about their workers, they can give a shit about our community, right? That's just the reality. And so um, this was like the mid nineties. Um, and there was, there was some traction at the state level that kind of, unfortunately when politicians rotate out, political will goes out the door, whoever comes next, whatever they care about, right? Um, and so after I graduated from UC Santa Cruz, I came back 
And it was actually a mailer that my grandma, because I would just go kick with my grandma and my grandpa, like, for hours, you know, to hear all the stories, the movement stories, the, you know, back in Mexico stories, all that stuff. And uh, she was like, hey, you know, this, this facility is still open, right? Um, and so that's the first time I heard about it. And I was like, and I was still on the younger end. So I was like, I don't even know what to do with this exactly, right? Um, but in joining East Yard as a member, um, and then and then joining the staff, I started to learn a little bit about what East Yard was doing at the time because the Mothers of East LA, Santa Isabel, stopped functioning when I when I went away to school. So when I came back, there wasn't like an organization for me to come back into. But a homie had hit me up about East Yard and was like, "Yo, like everything you talk about is right here. Like you need to come join this movement." And so I did. Um, and so. East Yard had already started to put pressure on the city of Vernon and then on the city of Commerce to try to pressure the city of Vernon uh, to shut down the facility. And the city of Vernon was like, you're talking about air quality? Like we, if they have a business permit, then they're gonna, they're gonna exist. Like we don't care about that other stuff. Um, and so, so then it was about figuring out, okay, that doesn't work. What is another avenue? And so ultimately what, what initially got Exide shut down was they Exide was allowed to pollute us to a certain extent. They're allowed to release a certain amount of lead, which is wild because there's no safe level of lead. Any lead exposure is like, right? Know that. For sure. Yeah. Um, so they're allowed. But every time uh, an inspector went to the facility, they were always exceeding that level. Like never were they under the level. So they would get fined, but then they weren't even collecting the fines. So it's literally worthless. It's nothing. The enforcement was, was terrible. Um, so the strategy was get the air district to change the policy, to reduce the amount of lead they could poison us with so that we can say the technology they have cannot reach that level. And so they shut them down. While they were shut down, that's when the federal government completed their investigation and then came through and said, we can either hit you with all these felonies or you can agree to permanently shut down the facility and clean up. Um, I'm trying to remember. So, uh, so what is the current status with Exxon? Because I feel like there was cleanup happening. Yeah. And there were rumors that they were basically cleaning up people's uh, front yards, uh -huh. keeping dirt away, and then dumping it somewhere in Arizona or New Mexico. But I don't, I don't know what's, the, do you have the latest? Oh yeah, for sure. I'm on, <laughs> I'm on the phone like multiple times a week talking to, whether it's like state agency folks, to local workers, to community members. And it's a mess. It's terrible. It's, um, I think some folks thought when we shut down the facility like a decade ago, like we won, you know? Mm -hmm. That was, that was just shutting off the tap. Now it's about going and cleaning up the mess. And, and it's been really difficult because ultimately the agency that allowed this to happen is responsible for overseeing the cleanup. So how are we going to trust them to do that right? And they don't, they don't do cleanups. So what they do is they contract out to construction companies. And these construction companies, they don't do cleanups. They do like demolition, right? Um, so they're not adhering to, to the specific protocols, right? Uh, but luckily we, we fought for local hire. We said if millions of dollars are gonna come into our community for cleanup, we want half of those jobs to be for community members, right? There needs to be a benefit for our community, right? Um, no high school diploma required. Um, if you have a record, you're not excluded. Um, and those are often barriers for a lot of our community members, right? And if y'all know of anybody, because there's going to be a, 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 here's a little plug, there's going to be a training that's going to happen for local community members to be able to get those jobs because um, we just restarted the cleanup. There's a whole lot of details to that. But ultimately, uh, the union that represents these workers is going to be offering a free training um, I think it's like two weeks of training and then you'll get the job placement and these jobs, you know, you're making over $40 an hour. I think it's 48, something like that is where you start, right? So no high school diploma, you can have a record. 
and and these are life-changing jobs for families right so if you know folks hit me up after i'll hit you the info um but the one of the reasons too that we fought for local hire was because we knew community members uh they they weren't going to stand for for bs right if they saw something not going down the right way they're going to say something because that's their neighborhood right and that's what happened uh, we had community members walking into our office to tell us, hey, this is what's going on in the cleanup. We have people calling us, texting us, emailing us. And so through that, we've been able to push back and say, hey, the contractor's cutting corners. The contractor is not doing proper things with the soil, right? And it's ranged from illegally putting it in dumps um, in, around LA that's not supposed to happen to dumping it in a neighbor's backyard which of course is not supposed to happen, right? Um, it's, it's, there's been a lot of issues. And then when workers speak out, they get targeted. They get uh, ridiculed, they get um, intimidated, they get fired. And these are all things we've had to fight. So um, recently we were able to have the contractor's contract end and get a new contractor. And this isn't the first time that that happens, but we have to get a contractor removed because they're, they're a bad actor. Um, so there's a new contract in place, and we were able to get a third-party monitor. And so this is a contractor that's in charge of overseeing what's happening and enforcing, essentially. Um, and we were, they were actually hired a community member who, who has been a longtime whistleblower of the contractors. And so he's out there, he's like, I already know the games you play, right? So I don't like, hey, come on, fool, like, I'm gonna have to take a picture of this. Like, just do it right, just do it right, you know? And so um, I think he's, he's definitely helping develop that rapport of like, like just all you gotta do is do the job. That's it. Like, you're, like these contractors are getting paid millions of dollars, just do the job. So it's a mess. There's a bunch of other drama that I won't get into because it's, it's, uh, it's always juicy, but a little, a little more complicated. Yeah, cheese man. If y'all are from the east side or from southeast LA, if you're from the the ex side impacted communities, we actually have a community meeting tonight. If you want to hear the cheese in detail of what's going down, because it's wild, uh, let talk to me after the class, and I'll let you know where it's going to be. Or I can, like I shot Jade the link for the Zoom. Um, y'all can join by Zoom. Yeah. All right. So next question. So this story offers at least a few lessons about public health and environmental justice and even larger complex issues like climate change. So if you could pick one or two lessons learned from your experience with Exide, what would they be? Um, I think one of them is um, you have to lead with solutions. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we've been so successful in this fight is we're like pulling these agencies along. They don't want to do the right thing. Um, sometimes they're allergic to the right thing. But when you, when you create the path for them to walk, they have no other option but to walk it. Because we're not just talking. We have a community movement to back it up, right, to force them to, to do that. Um, so a lot of times, and, and this is something that I think ECR members have been really good at. A lot of times, we're really good at, like, what we don't want. We're really good at what we're against. We're really good at what we're trying to stop. Um, but we're, sometimes we're doing that so much that we don't even have the space to think about what we do want, to think about our vision, to think about our dreams and, and how we want to get there. And so being able to do both of those things um, is really important for, for, uh, for keeping it moving. And then the second one is you can't trust the government. <laughs> you can't trust the government. And it's interesting because one of our members, um, you know, I joke with him because he, he, was in, he served in the military. He was very like America number one. And I've had conversations with him and he was just like, he was just like, it wasn't until I started to understand what was happening with this that I realized that like the government is made of people and there's a lot of terrible people in this world and a lot of terrible people are unfortunately are working for for government agencies and so over the years 
we've literally had to call out lies that the State Department of Toxic Substance Control is telling. One of the most egregious ones was they were telling principals of Exide impacted schools that they didn't have to worry about the lead. They said, there's no lead problem at your school. And so we had to go and actually look at the, the sample data. And we're like, oh, OK, we know how they gave you that number. They averaged it out. Right? So let's say you take 10 samples. Right? They didn't tell the principals, here's the result of 10 samples. They said, generally, here's your lead score. So what they did is they used the samples that are low to dilute the samples that are high. And so instead of telling that principal, that tree well on that playground has toxic levels of lead, they said, overall, your school is clean. And so we had to go and talk to the school board members and be like, yo, here's the data from the state saying that your schools are contaminated. And they were like, what? what are you talking about? They told us everything's fine. And we're just community members, right? So we're like, request this document from them and take a look for yourself. Right? So we have to kind of walk them through that path of how to do a PRA request, a Public Records Act request, all that type of stuff. And then they were like, yeah, it's right there. It's in their own tables, their own measurement tables that show that there's high levels of lead. And so instead of the cleanup happening over the summer when kids are not at the elementary schools, they were doing it during the first two weeks of school. And they were just putting some like little rinkadine orange fencing around the areas that were contaminated. Right. And so that's a threat to our community. Right. Like, and if, if we didn't advocate, if we didn't go look at those numbers and we didn't bring that forward, those schools would still be contaminated today. Right. Um, and there's a bunch of other examples of, of, of how, um, how DTSE has done that. But I think, especially when we're talking to like uh, some of our high school members, we're like, if you don't like math, homie, you need math. Like we need you to like understand how to like read, read uh, charts, how to like read uh, tables, uh, how to read graphs, because that's how they're going to represent the data to you. And so you got to be able to understand all of them to be like, well, why did you choose to, to represent the data in this one? And what would the data look like if it was represented in this other one, right? And that's where you catch them in, in trying to kind of hide the data, right? So um, yeah, I don't know. There's that saying like trust, but verify. It's yes. like, don't trust and you better go verify. <laughs> I love that. Actually, you, you might've noticed there was a bunch of chuckles going around when you said the data, the data, because you got to learn like the data yeah. stuff. Everybody here has like struggled with their epidemiology classes and their biostats <laughs> classes, and they're wondering the why yeah. of all of this, right? And yeah. you're trying to tell them what the why is, but it's good to hear it from your point of view. For sure. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I'm still stuck on one thing that was in your bio about this uh, the idea of you organizing where you were born. Yeah. And I think that is so, so powerful um, that you, when you have deep ties, to like a community, you feel empowered to do something about it. I know a lot of our students feel the same way. Like they want to do work in the communities where they were born and raised, where they live. Um, my family has roots in uh, Glassell Park and Highland Park going mm -hmm. back to mm -hmm. the 1930s. And my family lives there again now. Mm -hmm. We left it and moved to Ramona for a period of time. But there's a drive to like want to like improve the communities you live in. Um, I wondered if I could just nudge you to tell us more about that feeling and how that motivates you. Um, yeah. Cause I bet there are a lot of students here too are thinking like, I want to do things where I live. I don't know how to get active in doing it, but just the, if you could speak more about that feeling for you of working in the community where you were born and raised. For sure. I mean, I, I think the first like concrete act that anybody can do is love your community. Like, that's the first step. Sometimes that's the hardest step. Um, because our communities are filled with a lot of pain. Yeah. Our homes oftentimes are filled with a lot of pain. And so it's really hard to like think about loving this concept of community when you also have to hold that, that pain. Um, but it's critical because we are our community, 
And so if we don't love our community, then to a certain extent, it's like we don't love ourselves, right? And so that, to me, especially working with young folks, is so critical. If somebody loves their community, that's an expression of loving yourself, and that is a motivating factor for wanting to do right by your community and for your community, right? And so how do you get somebody to love their community? Uh, that's, that's a little harder, I think, of a concept to, to think about. It's not as easy of, a, of, of creating a step, but part of it is understanding that a lot of that pain that we hold because uh, a lot of the trauma we hold because of conditions in our communities um, aren't 100% our fault, right? Um, we live within systems that literally plan for our communities to be under the conditions that they're in, right? And that sometimes requires you to like go to college and take school courses and you start like, oh, damn, there's a whole, there's like structures here, like, you know, like, and, and oftentimes what that results in is then you look back at your family, you look back at your community and it's not that you just like forgive everything, but you start to understand and a different type of compassion can start to develop. I'm like, okay, now I understand that. Like that was a shitty experience that I had, but I'm starting to understand the, where the responsibility is. People have personal responsibility and their structural responsibility. And so one of the ways that we show that a lot in a really like, y'all, we just give me one workshop and, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll get you to it, is we do DIY beauty products. Hmm. DIY home cleaning products. And we say, this is how to do these things without poisoning your family, right? Because if you start throwing fabuloso around, that's toxic as hell, right? Things to clean your stove, things to clean your tub, things to clean your, uh, your toilet, toxic as hell. There's ways to clean them and make them look good and make them smell good without it being toxic. And it's actually cheaper if you make it yourself. You just have to know and you also have to trust that it's gonna work. Um, so we do that in the workshops, right? And so people are like, oh damn, like hell yeah. Like, you know, I, my kids wanna go outside whenever I'm cleaning the house, but like, this is gonna work for us, right? And we say, cool, you're responsible for your home, but the minute you open that door or you open that window, somebody else made decisions for your family and you're being exposed to things you didn't consent to, right? There's poisons coming in from outside and those decisions are made at your regional air board, at your city council, at your state air board, at these other agencies. That's where the decisions are made. And those things are business plans. There's companies that are literally, their plan is to poison us. Why? Because it's part of their profit motive because it costs money to not poison us, right? Like that's, that's the reality of the situation. Um, and so we say, you can, you can be the master of your home, but in order to, to have an impact on the community, we gotta come together. And to come together, you gotta be, get down with the movement. And, and that's how we get folks to be like, okay, I, I can like protect my family with the, the limited decisions I can make. But for these other things, I need to connect with other folks and, and take that next step to protect my family and protect my community. Just a, an observation about that too. You know, one thing I always notice is that like as places gentrify, mm -hmm. like they build higher and higher fences. Mm -hmm. It seems like the gates get bigger, the fences get, <laughs> the, the plants get taller. And I feel like that that sort of separates people again. Like it kind of, mm -hmm. it's like I can take care of me and my own, but I'm not part of this larger connected community. For sure. And so like I've been, part of my question for you is like, how do you overcome that, that, that movement to isolate or separate ourselves? Yeah, I mean, and even thinking about just the COVID experience, like oh, y'all went through schooling through isolation, right? Which is, a, I, I did it, so I don't fully understand it. But that's, that's wild. There's impacts to that, right? I think um, I think part of it is talking to folks about what community organizing is. Because a lot of times people think community organizing is like a million people marching in downtown LA. 
And I would say that's not community organizing, that's activism, which is important. And, and that type of demonstration is a tool that's important. But as soon as that march is over, everybody goes home, right? Did you actually build any relationships with folks, right? So what I tell folks, community organizing is you have a wayaba tree, you have a lemon tree, you have an orange tree. If you got an avocado tree, for sure, you're a community organizer because you don't eat all of it, right? So what do you do? Your mom might be like, lleva la bolsa al vecino, <laughs> right? Go take the bag to your neighbor. Uh, your tia's going to come. We're going to give her a bag, you know, get, take a bag to your professors, you know, that type of stuff, uh, especially if you got avocado cheese, right? Um, <laughs> That, uh, that resource sharing is a form of organizing, right? Because if you hook me up with a bag of, of oranges, I don't got to buy oranges this week. So that's keeping money in my pocket. Those oranges, I'm pretty sure you didn't go and put like industrial pesticides on them, right? So it's going to be healthier for my family. Plus, a truck didn't have to drive those oranges into my community and pollute us in the process. That's a form of community organizing. We may not see all the like impacts of it, but that is a form, right? I think about um, my grandma's like a senora de las plantas, right? And uh, there might be some of y'all in here that might be why you're interested in public health is you got some senoras de las plantas in your family, but uh, the lady of the plants, right? So somebody would come to my grandma's house and be like, my daughter is this, this, and this. You know, this is her symptoms, and my grandma will go outside and get different herbs and come back and be like, do this, do that, do this, do that, put some honey and lemon on it, and they'll be good, right? That, that like, traditional knowledge sharing, that's a form of community organizing. Now that lady don't got to go and, and buy day cool or whatever meds, right, and that doesn't have to expose her kid to, you know, what potentially might have side effects. They keep money in their pocket. That's not trucked into our communities. It doesn't, it's not produced in another community, right? That's a form of, of community organizing. Um, it's sometimes, you know, somebody on the block might lose their job, right? So then the chismosos and chismosas, aka community organizers in the neighborhood, they start talking about it, right? Sometimes it is like messed up, right? But sometimes it's if you hear of anything, let them know. They know how to do tile. They know how to paint. On my mom's block, the dude had a disability, but he knew how to change brakes. So anybody in the neighborhood who wanted their brakes changed would pull up, hook them up with a six pack and some cash, and, and they would change the brakes for cheaper than if they went to Pet Boys or wherever, right? Uh, so that type of resource sharing, information and resource sharing, that's community organizing. And it's things that our families do all the time. It's literally the only way a lot of families can survive, right? So that idea of community organizing isn't something that's so huge and grand that you need to aspire to. Like, I would ask you to recognize the ways you're already doing that. Or the way you're being organized. Somebody's probably organizing you and you're doing this. You're like, oh, damn, I didn't even realize I was part of this, like, this practice. And so then... You, you take that skill up and think, well, how can I do that? How can I leverage those relationships to address this other issue or, or respond to this other concern? On that note, before I forget, I have organic lemons from a tree because I cannot consume all those. So be sure to get one. And there's some bananas. There you go. Uh, pick one up. You can make a healthy salad dressing with olive oil and a little salt and pepper and healthy. For sure. Squeeze a lemon, take a little shot to, for the throat health right now. I know there's a, sorry, be fast. There's like some some you know illnesses going around right now. On that note, we've got masks and hand sanitizer. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So the next question is: Our Department of Public Health is holding these events to learn more about what we can do to address or prevent climate change, mm -hmm. and we're also trying to build community to make this happen, but it sometimes feels overwhelming to think about such a large problem, and it feels out of our hands. So what advice might you have about taking action, even when it's overwhelming and it seems impossible to fight it? 
for sure. Because climate change is like, it's, it's the whole world. <laughs> How are you going to solve the whole world's problem? Um, I think, so in the trajectory of this movement that's called environmental justice, I think about my grandparents, they never called it environmental justice, right? They were like just calling out the specific companies or agencies or whatever. I learned about environmental justice when I got into college. I was like, oh, that's what you call what we do? Okay, cool. Um, but for me, part of it was like, oh, this, this feels like, and the, the government adopted it for sure. This feels like you don't want to call it environmental racism because you don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. So then later comes uh, climate justice, which feels like, because environmental justice is like neighborhood oriented, but climate justice like can include everyone, which is cool, right? Being inclusive, but it feels like it removed it further from our communities. And so I, I push back on, on those ideas because, because of environmental racism, because of environmental white supremacy, climate change starts in our neighborhoods. Climate change doesn't start in the Arctic, right? Climate change starts right here because the biggest climate change contributors are the companies in our communities. And so we don't need to go and look for the dolphins or the old growth forest, or we can look here on our blocks. Right. And so what I say is climate change starts in our bodies and climate change will end in our bodies. And we're going to be the ones to end it. It's not going to end on its own. Right. So by changing what is possible in our communities, we, we change the world. Right. I, I think there's that old saying, like, think globally, act locally. And I'm just like, act locally, impact globally. Right. Because again, the, some of the biggest corporations in the world, they operate in our communities, right? And so if we make it impossible for them to kill our, our planet, to kill us, then, then that's the only way it's, it's not going to happen, right? And I tell folks, if you really want to understand climate change, you got to understand, right? If you want to think about it as the health of the planet, you got to understand the health of our communities. The health of our communities is an indicator of the health of the planet. Absolutely. I, I was going to mention my, my grandparents, since I was a little girl, they would collect cans, mm -hmm. you know, to make a few, you know, extra bucks. Mm -hmm. And they were practicing sustainability without yeah. even knowing it. And now I collect cans, but I'm, you know, I want to recycle and mm -hmm. try to help a little bit um, with climate change. So it's, it, it's interesting what you say that, you know, our families have been practicing that way before For it sure. had a name or any kind of connotation. For sure. Yeah, just to, to add on to that a little bit, I think um, like the folks often who have the least are the ones who have the least impact. Yes. Right? Um, and so often that's where you're going to find the solutions. Unfortunately, at the global scale, some of that gets twisted sometimes, right? So like the amount of, just as an example, single-use plastics that have entered daily life in third world countries um, is, is something that is strategic uh, because oil companies see the future is not combustion. Their future, their economic, their business future is plastics. And so that's what they're going towards. And so they're trying to make plastics everywhere. So I was in Colombia trying to connect with folks on goods movement, on ports and all of this. And they were like, you got to come see our beach. And I'm like, cool, beautiful. One of the most beautiful places I've ever been in the world until I looked down. And the beach is covered in plastic. So they said 30 years ago, this was non-existent. Something has changed in the world where now this is our reality. And they're like, we get plastics here that are from Cali from like the, the big cities in Colombia. And we have plastics from as far as Spain landing on the shore here. Right. And so um, it, it, it is important to, to like look at our communities, but also look back in time in our communities 
to find some of those solutions because some of the current conditions in our communities uh, have been modified uh, because of, again, the profit motive that some of these companies have. So, um, so our students are activists at heart and they wanna make a difference in their local communities. Uh, what is one or two things that they could do today or tomorrow to help with the environmental movement? Um, I guess maybe two would be, so one would be, uh, there's a tool called the Cal Enviro Screen. Um, some of y'all might use it in your classes already. Definitely use it because um, you can look up your neighborhood, right? You can look up any neighborhood, but look up your neighborhood and see what's impacting your neighborhood. That's one way to start to find out like what's going on in your neighborhood. Um, and that tool, because uh, it's not the easiest tool to use, um, but a motivating factor that I hope to impart to y'all right now is that tool comes from our communities. That tool comes from the movement. That tool comes from our communities being like, you act like this facility is an island. It is not. It's next door to another toxic facility. And it's across the street from another toxic facility. There's something called cumulative impact. But the agencies were just thinking about, oh, this one company is okay. Right? So we actually went door to door looking at what's actually in our communities and comparing it to agency data. What does the government think is here? And we're out walking, what is actually here? And of course, what we found is tons of things that the government doesn't even know is going on in our communities. Tons of toxic things, right? So that leads to enforcement. And then uh, a couple of academic partners kind of turned that into the EJ screen model, uh, which became like an academic tool. And the EJ screen model was the basis for the Calvin viral screen. Um, so that's our tool, y'all. That comes from our community, so definitely use that. And then once you do that, um, do some research, connect, find out, is, is there anybody in my community um, who's doing something about this? Because if there is, connect with them. If there isn't, that's where you gotta consider, what could I do, right? And, you know, a lot of times your family's going to be like, hey, you're annoying, dude. <laughs> like, like, so what? I use Amazon, right? I don't care. And you're like, what? Well, they got these facilities in our communities and they want the trucks and these vans that are polluting us and the plastics and this and that and that. And they're like, hey, you're annoying, right? <laughs> Find somebody who doesn't think you're annoying. That's all it takes. Find one person who doesn't think that you bringing up these issues is annoying. Because then you're gonna be like, all right, I'm not crazy, right? Cause that's how it could feel. It can feel like, like you're weird or you're like, cause nobody else cares about what you're caring about. Find somebody else who cares about it too and, and start plotting. That's where you start like, what can we do, right? And I don't know, make an make a Instagram page just to like put some info out there and like force follow all your like homies and your family like you know like just to start to influence that way and then when you do that you'll find other people and, and like that you start to kind of make those connections but I, I think more than anything like learn from what other folks are doing you don't have to invent something brand new sometimes you do and sometimes people are going to learn from you but just like just do something right? Like anything contributes. And what I tell folks is we don't need everybody in our community uh, to go knock on doors. We need some people to do that. We don't need everybody in our community to be out here giving speeches. We need some people to do that. We don't need everybody in our community to do anything. We need everybody in our community to do everything. So we need educators who care about this. We need people in public health who care about this. We need people in, in I don't know, people who are into culinary, uh, the culinary field to care about this. We need people in literally every aspect of society to care about this because we're whole communities, right? We're not just a little, a little thing, an idea, we're whole communities. And so we need our whole communities to be able to shift and move 
And not everybody's going to care about the same thing, but then find out what do you care about? How can I like connect that to, to this larger issue? Um, so I don't know if that was, that wasn't very concrete, but like, I don't know, figure it out and let me know so I can share it <laughs> the next time. <laughs> my, my takeaway is do everything. Yeah, for sure. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so I know that we passed out index cards to invite questions. If you have them, it's a nice, hopefully easy way, comfortable way to share questions. Um, if you have an index card that you filled out, maybe you could just hold it up and uh, maybe Naomi, you could grab index cards from folks if there are questions. And uh, I believe uh, folks online, there's a Q&A section, or at least there's a chat there. Um, so you're welcome. If you posted a question there, if you'd like to post a question there, we'd be glad to read it off and get your questions answered. Thank you. Oh, it's a King Hall question. <laughs> this is what you and I were talking about before. Yeah. This is great. Uh, there's an asbestos pro problem in King Hall uh, here on campus as students. What advice can you give us to advocate for ourselves when it seems like the problem is just being swept under the rug? Literally, yeah. There. Yeah. Um, look at the data. Request the data. Don't just accept a statement from the university. Um, request the data so you can actually look at it because maybe they are telling the truth. Maybe it's not an issue you have to worry about, um, which is highly unlikely, but look, look at the data, right? Um, I think there's a big issue, not even just in the country, but in the world where a lot of things have been done the wrong way, but they're already done and that becomes the status quo. So it gets maintained. So building with asbestos, not the best thing to do. It was believed to be the best thing at a certain time. And now it's everywhere. I remember my first grade classroom, the summer after I was in first grade, I look at, I, we passed by the school and it's demolished. And I was like, what happened to my classroom? It had asbestos. And I'm like, when did you find out it had asbestos? Right? Because I spent the whole year in that classroom. Right? So a lot of times decisions are made based on what people in power think is feasible, what's possible. Right? Did they have another classroom for us to sit in? Probably not. So they're like, these fools got to sit in that classroom. Did they have the funding to demolish it and build a whole new classroom? Probably not. So they're like, these schools got to sit in that classroom, right? There's other things that inform decision-making besides like hard science, right? Oftentimes it's, it's just about logic. And so what you consider logical may be illogical to someone else. What someone else thinks is logical, you may think is illogical. And part of it is, what are you prioritizing? So somebody who's there, that's actually their job is to make a decision on what happens with this building is gonna be thinking about how much is that gonna cost? Does the university have the funds for that? What classes or what, what activities happen in that building? Where are they gonna happen during deconstruction, right? Those are all things. Oftentimes, usually corporations are going to think, if we admit this is a problem, who's going to sue us? Sue us. Yeah. Right? And can we afford that? That becomes a whole other part of, of the analysis, right? Uh, I know for me, I'm like, I don't give a shit about money. What's right is right. And... Poisoning us is not right. So whatever we got to do to stop being poisoned, then, then that's what we got to do. And we'll, we'll figure it out along the way. And part of just going back to the Exide issue, we had to pressure the governor to commit money to cleaning up our communities. And of course, it was only a portion of the funds. And we were like, the next governor, they may not care. And so we passed a, a battery fee bill. So now whenever you go buy a car battery or you buy a new car, there's a fee that's applied that now collects 20 to $40 million a year that can go towards cleaning up communities. So that way, if the governor gets mad at us or gets hurt because we embarrass them or whatever, we don't got to worry about being in their good graces to keep the cleanup going. Thanks. 
right? So that's why I talk about like if you if you if you come demanding and you have the path forward, it's gonna be easier for them to just follow your lead. Got it. There's a whole bunch of questions on this card, so I'm trying to pick just a <laughs> couple of them. This person's got a lot of ideas. Um, you you mentioned that agencies have sometimes difficulty, like releasing all the information or they, they've got kind of half truths mm -hmm. are there any penalties that like agencies can face for doing that um I mean, this almost sounds like a legal question but uh, yeah yeah you have, like any insight on that well what's interesting is if y'all publish something your name's got to be on it right when these agencies yeah. be publishing their stuff they don't gotta put no names on it it's, it's just coming agency. from the agency sure and then you have people within the agency who are going to protect those people because they don't want the agency to get sued. Um, there's tons of layers of bureaucracy that allow people to escape accountability. Um, probably one of the nastiest things that I've seen is when you're in a meeting with somebody in power and you're breaking down what the issue is, and the next time you come and talk to them, they've used what you brought up and created a whole new story to justify everything. And you're like, what? That wasn't the situation two weeks ago. Now, all of a sudden, y'all were doing these things behind the scenes that we never heard of that you admitted weren't happening two weeks ago. But now you're going to act like it wasn't that the whole time. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's really nasty. And I think, I mean, it's hard. Do I want the names of everybody? Yes. Do I want to hold everybody individually accountable? Yes. But there's so much going on. There's so many issues. There's so many things to do that I'm going to be 100%. That just hasn't been my priority. I've asked other folks to do it like, yo, can you go and see who in this agency is, has this background? Can you go and look at these politicians and look at their donations and see who's donating money is was were people at Excite donating money to these elected officials how, how did this happen right there's folks who specialize in doing that type of work that's not my specialty my specialty is being out here in my community um so i wish those things would happen it's rare for that level of accountability yeah, to right. happen and plus things turn over probably so for quickly. sure they go and move to some other agency yeah. and yeah that'd be hard um this is an interesting question because this combines like kind of our health policy health services backgrounds um with environmental stuff so you know hospitals uh if they receive federal funding mm -hmm. they have to do what's called like a health needs assessment they're mm -hmm. supposed to do like a community what? needs assessment um, I know that. And I've, I've sat on a, a, one of these panels for Children's Hospital, LA. Um, <clears throat> they need to provide solutions and actions for doing this. I, do you have any, it doesn't sound like you're aware of this, but like, do you see any role for hospitals? Yeah, for sure. I, I've never heard of that. That sounds like a great tool that could engage folks like us because I, I've spoken to folks in, in public health before. I've spoken to like, I, I teach a class at USC to, to folks that are becoming doctors. Um, one of the things that I talk to them about is wherever you're going to be, you're going to be in a community. And you're going to see the people of that community. And so for you to understand what health issues they're bringing to you, you got to learn the community. And one of those things is, what are the sources of contamination in that community, right? So you might be working at a clinic or you might be working at a, at a, at a hospital that's right next to the East LA interchange. And all these kids keep coming in with respiratory issues. And you can treat it like it's just another kid, it's just another kid, it's just another kid. Or you can be like, well, what's causing all of this, right? And what are the educational opportunities as part of the service the health service of like talking to the families about what's going on, right? Because oftentimes thinking specifically about asthma, a lot of blame is placed on the children. It's because of what they're doing. That's why they had an asthma uh, attack, right? No se aplaca, right? Right? Like they don't, they don't like chill. That's why they have an asthma attack. Just chill. If you just chilled, you wouldn't have an asthma attack, right? 
but so much of it has to do with air quality, right? For a community that's right by a refinery, was there a flare that day? Because that's going to result in a bunch of hospitalizations. And as a parent, if you're not thinking about this, you're just like, damn, why is my kid just always like not doing what I'm telling them to do so they don't get an asthma attack, right? I, I was here in a class one time with some folks talking to students, talking about this specific thing. And somebody came up after and was like, I have a kid with asthma and I trip on them whenever they have an asthma attack. I didn't understand that there's all these other factors. And she's like, that, like, what I just learned right now is going to impact the relationship that I have with my child the rest of our lives, right? And so that level of information is transformative, right? And then if more folks in the community try to understand that, it's like, okay, maybe we should do something about this. And that creates an opportunity for that larger social change. So do you need to be the person out there making posters and with a bullhorn and all of that? Maybe your poster is a, is a fact sheet in the clinic. Maybe your bullhorn is the individual conversations you're having with families. Like that is critical for, for what's happening in our communities. That's great. I know um, we've got a question online, Theo. Thank you. Did you post it up? Oh, I see, okay. Has there ever been a time when data is false? Boy, we get our statistics person in here. <laughs> What other resources can you rely on when you feel like the data is not quite truthful or it's being manipulated? Like you were describing that averaging. Yeah, it's, it's primarily been the representation of data. Um, we've never been able to be like, this is false data. We have been able to hear from like folks in the field where they're like, hey, this is being manipulated and then we're able to push back. Um, but it usually is around the representation of data. What's told to us, what's not told to us, how it's told how that's part of a, a narrative that's basically about reducing liability for the state. That's always what it is about reducing liability, which I'm sure is what's happening with King Hall as well. It's like, how do we reduce liability? Um, what other resources can you rely on? So we actually um, had been calling for years for homes that already got cleaned up because of Exide to get resampled. Because our fear was homes were getting recontaminated because let's say they cleaned my home right? And then they come back a year later and clean Jade's home, my neighbor. Some of that dust is going to come back to my home. It's going to recontaminate my home, right? So there was a, a fear around that. Um, also, there's a cleanup area. Almost every home in the cleanup area is contaminated. So we're like, obviously, that's not the right boundary. You need to keep going until you find homes that are not contaminated. And so what we were calling for was sampling homes outside of that 1.7 mile radius. And we kept calling for this and calling for this. And finally, one of our partners from USC was like, hey, I got this grant opportunity that we can apply for and we can buy the machine to test soil. So we're like, hell yeah, we've been wanting that machine, but it costs like $70,000. We don't got $70,000, right? But this grant's got $70,000, so they were able to buy the machine and house it at USC. And so we went and collected 300 samples from 300 homes, so it's like 900 samples. And what we found was, of the homes that we sampled that were already clean, four out of five of them still had high levels of lead. Hmm. What we found was, for the homes outside of the cleanup area, almost 97% of those homes have high levels of lead. So it's showing us the cleanup's not happening right and the cleanup area is not large enough. What we also found out when we were door knocking, talking to people is they were telling us what was happening. Oh yeah, they didn't even touch that area. This area that's contaminated, they didn't even touch it. Or oh, that area, they just sprinkled some like new dirt on top of it, but the old dirt's still right there. Right, all these ways that the contractor was cutting corners. So we're like, damn, it's not even what we originally thought. It's these other reasons why the contamination is still there. Um, so us being able to go back and test ourselves was critical um, to this kind of next phase of our push. This is great. It's like a bit of a DIY yeah. situation, which we are all used to doing here at Cal State. Right? <laughs> that, that's our modus operandi. 
Um, I just want to be cognizant of time. I think um, maybe just a quick mm -hmm. one little last question, if you can keep it short. Uh, is there a backstory to the spelling of your name? <laughs> just, you know, autocorrect keeps trying to fix the way I spell his name. Yeah. Okay, Sam, with an exclamation point at the end. Yeah, yeah. So um, the lowercase m uh, is is definitely like bow hooks related. If y'all know who bow hooks is, um, uh, she's like a, a radical black feminist scholar. Um, and so she she spells her name with a lowercase b, a lowercase h. Um, and bow hooks is her pen name. That's actually not her birth name. Um, but she she talks about like humbling herself, right? Because what words get capitalized, what words don't. Um, and so I was like, ah, oh, that's that's cool. I like that. It's like a constant reminder, like to check yourself. Um, and then somebody years later was like, oh, I thought it's because you're an anti-capitalist. And I was like, <laughs> I am. So yes, definitely. I'm gonna say that now. And the exclamation point is because I'm enthusiastic about being anti-capitalist. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just stylized my name that way. And for a, a while, like when I was in undergrad, I didn't like folks just knew, knew that was my name. When they would see it, they knew that's who I was. I wouldn't like have to even use Lopez. Um, but coming back to LA, it's much larger. So, uh, so I did. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's kind of where that comes from. Even longer before that, I started using the exclamation point because there was another Mark Lopez in my high school. Oh, and we were in the same classes together, and uh, I just achieved academically like higher. And I was like, I don't want that fool's grade. <laughs> so I let the teacher know, hey, any when you see this exclamation point, that's me. Um, so that's how I originally started started using it, and I just kept it. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Well, um, let me just say a thank you, a big thank you, uh, on the behalf of the Department of Public Health and our whole book reading. Our, behalf of our students and our graduate students. Um, thank you so much for being here. I, I promised them that they would learn a lot. <laughs> I'm 100% sure that they did, I did. Um, so can we give him a round of applause? Please? From the east side, if you're from Southeast LA, if you're from the South Bay area, like Long Beach, Wilmington, all of that, those are the communities we organize in. So if you wanna get involved, we have monthly meetings in the communities and on Zoom. Um, so hit me up. Like I mentioned, there's an Excite meeting tonight. Um, so if you want to hear that cheese in it, uh, I'll be right here. Thank you so much.